Well, especially when you're transferring the baby from home or birth center via ambulance to a hospital, it seems to me to be the best of all worlds to not have to have that fidgeting the baby in the ambulance. Yeah. And then transferring the baby somehow to the hospital setting. Hi, my name is Augustine Colebrook, and I'm the principal at Midwifery Wisdom Collective. I speak on this podcast about big picture, political issues, and the future of our profession. Hey, y'all. I am Jamara, and I'm a midwife. I'm also a birth justice activist. And this season, I am looking forward to sharing stories of Black midwives and the communities they serve. Hello, beloved birth community. I'm Angela Love nurse midwife since 2004, preceptor, and mother. I have a home birth practice called Midwife Love and a national telehealth practice called Midwife Rx. My mission is to keep birth choices available and to educate the next generation of midwives for our daughters and grandchildren. Matriarchy now. I'm Layla Wyatt. I get to share with you the voices of student midwives from across the country and beyond. This season, we focus on those students who just graduated, are about to sit for the NARM, or did yesterday, and we get tips and tricks for you for what happens at the end of the student midwife journey. Welcome back to another Midwifery Wisdom podcast, and I'm so excited to welcome my next guest, Ms. Annie McLaughlin. I'm so glad you're here. Will you tell us a little bit about your history to midwifery? Because there's an exciting part of your profession that we want to talk about today, but first give us the background. Sure. Um, I started doing births in 1980 and um, was asked to be at a birth as a Lamaze instructor. Um, I already knew I wanted to be a midwife, but the path wasn't easy. Uh, I was a military wife and we moved every three years. And so I would get to the top of the list for nursing school and we'd move. So I moved to California and I apprenticed with another midwife for a while and uh, became a direct entry midwife. I um, subsequently moved to El Paso and did an internship there and became part of the staff. So I worked home birth for a while, did a birth center for a while. And it was at that point as a single mom, I realized I needed to have a more stable work life. So I went back to school, became an RN, and moved to New Mexico, where I had a license. And I did both a home birth practice, quite busy, four to six births a month, and a 32-hour a month. Uh, oh, excuse me, a week slot at a local hospital that had a strong nurse midwifery program. Um, it was a great time, and I was there for about three and a half years, and uh, went back to California to do a nurse midwifery program. I worked as an RN in labor and delivery. I worked as a nurse midwife in labor and delivery, and over time realized it just wasn't my forte. Things were changing, more epidurals and less one-on-one. And so I moved back into home birth only. During all that time, I was still doing home births, but um, this has always been my heart. Uh, I spent a a few months in Guatemala as director of a birth center and uh, then came back to do only home birth. Wow. Uh, I've been doing that uh, on the East Coast, the West Coast, and now I'm in New Mexico. Again, amazing. <laughs> amazing. You've worked in basically all care location, home, hospital, birth center. You've worked in and out of the United States. You've worked as both a CNM and a CPM and an RN. And in all of these scenarios, I'm guessing you started to see a pattern. You started to see um, a Bradlin, specifically with resuscitation 
and it led you to create an incredible revolutionary device. So tell us about your creation. How did that come to be? Well, again, as you say, this is a problem regardless of what location you're in. In the hospital setting, you put the baby on the warmer and you have four or five people around the baby and helping to stabilize the baby's position, get the airway open and do the resuscitation. Um, but again, that takes many, many hands and it's still not a very efficient way to position the baby and keep the airway open. As a birth center, a home birth midwife, the situation is a little different because there may only be one or two people there. And so I created a support that you can place the baby in and maintain the open airway position. And we call it the recessa cradle because it does cradle the baby's head and it's designed to fit multiple sizes of babies. We've had a four and a half pounder in it. We've had a 10 and a half pounder in it. And it does stabilize all heads. Now, the one exception might be a baby with incredible molding, but there are ways to make that uh, work as well. Amazing. And um, the the cradle, the recessive cradle, is it, it its main purpose is to stabilize the infant in that sniffing position so that when you're giving maybe with adrenaline maybe not super in charge of all of your own faculties the baby stays in that optimal position but then you notice other benefits i think we've we've had this chat before so that's how i i know i'm a little bit <laughs> informed but i i want to share this with our audience because it's really important um resuscitation started to get better while using this support tell us more about what you the feedback you've gotten from people who are using it i certainly have some feedback to share with people who are using it oh thank you um the the feedback has been phenomenal uh many many babies have been in cradles during resuscitations and the feedback has always been very positive with that one exception of a, an incredible molded head <laughs> um to the, to the point that there have been some cradles that have gone missing during the transfer into the hospital, and those midwives have immediately called me and told me their story and have ordered another cradle because they simply don't want to be without one. Uh, it What it does, in my opinion, in my experience, is to really take down the adrenaline for the midwife. Uh, my very first experience using it was uh, a birth of twins and the first baby was born and seemed a little shocky. I put him in the cradle and the other midwife used her stethoscope and said, the baby's, the air is going in, the chest is rising. And my first response was, well, yeah, however, I had never ever had that experience in the hospital or at home or in the birth center. It was so easy to get the baby into a good sniff position and stabilize him. And he was about five and a half pounds. Uh, it, it, just, it just made it so easy to just go right to bag and mask and not have to fiddle with the head and try to keep that airway open. That airway is so tiny that even a slight tilt to one side or the other can close it down. So that was my first personal experience, and I've had many midwives call me and tell me about their stories as well. That's awesome. Yeah, I've gotten feedback. I mostly mentor mentors now. You know, I don't do a lot of direct patient care. But what I keep hearing back is um, midwifery mentors are loving this for their ability to teach students right from the beginning. Um, because there isn't that fiddling. There isn't that trying to um, make this imaginary position work with just your hands on the side of a tub or over a mom's shoulder, like the different ways that we have made this work or, um, you know, on those flat surfaces, right? Like it, it's so ergonomically correct that there, 
it's like we skip a bunch of steps in order to get this into a student's head where it belongs. You know, they're like, oh, I see it now. That's what has to happen. And from that, you can then resuscitate over a mom's shoulder or over a top or whatever. But if you don't see it originally, it's really hard to conceptualize. And I love that about it being a tool for education as well as for literally saving lives. And I think that's really true. It, I, uh, I work with a lot of birth centers and preceptors, and it's interesting that, that students are ordering this before they even finish their preceptorship. They want to have it in their bag in case they're the first person at a birth. It's amazing. Yeah. And some preceptors are actually gifting uh, yeah. recessor cradles to their students as they graduate, which is sweet. That's a, it's an amazing gift. It gives to life. That's very awesome. Well, so um, I I know that one of the projects you've been involved in recently is trying to get the recessive cradle onto ambulances. Tell us about this journey. Well, one of the, we have two different cradles. We have the original cradle, which is basically all sealed foam. And the second version that we uh, created is uh, has a platform underneath with slots that can strap the baby in and also strap the baby onto a gurney or cot or stretcher, however you call it in your area. Uh, and that allows babies to be transported in an open airway position rather than as they normally will do either flat mm -hmm. or in a car seat, which is in incredibly dangerous. Right. A baby who's struggling to breathe, that's the very worst position. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So have you been successful? Are there any regions in the country that are adopting this? Not yet. It's amazing. I, and I think that there, some of them are depending on the midwife to have it. And then sometimes there's even a hassle allowing it to be used, which is really frustrating. Yeah. But the ones that are using it, basically, it's a grab and go. They've got the baby in the cradle and they just pick the cradle up and take the baby in it. Yep. 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 Well, it would be so incredible. I mean, not just for home birth transfers, but for like all neonates they might pick up. Right. Deep. Incredible. Right. If you have a baby with SIDS or you have a baby in a car accident that you need the baby to be stabilized but but not breathing, being in the car seat still, which is how they normally would transfer the baby, is not a good idea. Uh, yeah, I, I did some research and found that there are about um, 900 rollover accidents in ambulances every year, 900. And if a mom is placed on the gurney and the, then the baby is placed on top of her, she's expected to hold that baby. And that's how they would transfer in some locations. I can't even imagine the feeling a mom would have if there was a rollover and she couldn't hold on to her baby. Well, I just, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of car accidents. No, or no, the right. physics of it doesn't know that. Yeah, right. yeah. Exactly. And I think it's the subject of, of several, you know, drama TV shows like Grey's Anatomy or like, right <laughs> for like, <laughs> it's the stuff of, of nightmares and um, to have that, that clear position and then the additional methods is brilliant. I like, I can't understand what the hesitancy is. Well, in the hospital setting, we did approach one hospital in, in Michigan, and they the nurse manager was extremely happy and wanted to get it in. But what she found was that there was a series, a large series of committees that had to, it had to go through, and they ultimately just kind of shelved it. Uh, again, it doesn't matter what location you're in. Having the baby in a stable position is so critical for the, for the life of that baby. Yeah, to get them stabilized. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, rhetoric in the medical world that it takes 17 years for studies to become implemented as actual practice. I would say that sounds right. <laughs> this might be one of those issues. Is that it's going to take that long until it gets integrated? It's just incredibly frustrating for you, I'm sure. 
Uh, and for the providers on the ground, and I mean, that's one of the reasons that we love uh, community-based midwifery is that we can implement things so much faster. We can see right. trends. We can see the evidence. Mm -hmm. Evidence-based. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep, definitely. I love the new phrase, evidence-informed. I don't know if you've heard about this. No. Um, it's a way to counter the idea that we're discounting empirical knowledge, felt knowledge, experience uh, in favor of only academic knowledge. Um, and so evidence-informed practice is one where we highly rate the evidence, but it doesn't trump our own experience of being midwives. Gotcha. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I like it better well, in some way. And and the reality is the evident evidence based things that we do in the hospital setting aren't really evidence based. You know, it's very frustrating to me to because evidence has moved. Right? Someone yeah. to your trust. Yeah, yeah. If I yeah. just couldn't, I couldn't be part of it. And I thought that I could make a change in that setting, but I was wrong. <laughs> well, um. Yeah, you're not alone. I feel like that's a pretty common uh, lament. Sure. Yeah. Um, and who knows? Maybe 17 years from now. <laughs> Row <Right>. more trees. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. But it's really exciting. And I'm, I'm sure you have a marketing team and, and you have people involved in, in helping to expand the, the adoption of this um, really incredibly simple but brilliant solution. Um, where are you going next? What it, what are your plans? Like, what's next for this? With with the recessa cradle, I'm still plugging away at the um, at the uh, hospitals. We have uh, another midwife in our area who's doing the also program this weekend, and plans to take both models in to show them, and mm -hmm. um, you know, just trying to get those who uh, have approached me about their ambulance teams. I'm willing to go anywhere. I'm willing to fly, to drive, to present to ambulance companies, because I think that that's going to be the way into the hospital setting. Yeah. Kind of through the back door. I love that. Yeah. When, when the EMS keeps bringing babies that are fully stable and breathing, the hospital might be like, oh, this is a good idea. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I had a, a hit as kind of a thought. There's um there's an interesting um I think pilot program happening in Utah. I don't know if you're aware of it, where um it's a collaboration they've got some some federal funding to create these training videos and courses between midwives, birth centers, EMS, and OB units, so that they're they're essentially creating these these scenarios and they film the real life stack but in fake scenarios through the transition of how you safely transfer a mother or an infant um and what is communicated what actions are happening who does what and i thought we should we should connect you with that crew you know that would be amazing because i think that would again, open up that, that conversation about how this works and how beneficial it is to babies. Yeah. It's amazing. I know. I heard about it a couple of years ago. Um, I don't, I don't know how it fully has been implemented yet, but I knew that they got the funding and had started the filming and the interviewing and the process in order to create this kind of um, pilot project that could be taken nationally of how to integrate midwifery. Right. That's Excellent. one of the biggest problems. I know it's really exciting. Uh, but stabilizing the infant in the recessive cradle seems like kind of a no brainer when it goes from care to care. Right. Really smart. Well, especially when you're transferring the baby from home or birth center via ambulance to a hospital, it seems to me to be the best of all worlds to not have to have that fidgeting the baby in the ambulance. Yeah. And then transferring the baby somehow to the hospital setting yeah definitely um yeah I, I recently did a case review with a midwife after one of her transfers and um she had stabilized the infant in the recessive cradle and uh it was strapped to a board and the board had taped to it 
the pulse oximeter. Um, and then the whole thing transferred from the ambulance and then into oh, the interesting. And, um, then she had to fight to try to get those belongings back. But, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you know, and I always recommend midwives, like, use a sharpie label your absolutely and we have a place on the back of the cradle for just that and i always say everybody's going to be focused on the baby follow your cradle exactly. make sure you know where it is exactly. um but but i thought that that was a really brilliant um mechanism where like the evaluation of the like we created a portable neonatal unit essentially is what she right there so that anyone who did come in her face could like look at the baby look at the numbers and help the clinical decision making instead of you know constantly ignoring the midwife or bugging them for information it's like we've created this scenario where it's all right there well the um the pulse oximeter that I use would fit between the baby's feet uh -huh. and still be usable. And so uh -huh. I'm thinking that, you know, that having another board underneath. Now, the, the transport board has a firm base, uh -huh. and that allows it to be strapped to the baby and also strapped to the gurney. So I'm wondering if that's what she's talking about or she has something else, like a plenty would be it. Yeah, I'm not sure I didn't see it. But um, yeah, I was I was really impressed with that that level of professionalism, and that's kind of what we're doing here, right? Is we're professionalizing mobile care, right? Yeah, right. To the point that I, as I was teaching, I would not call my students uh, apprentices because that almost infers um, a craftsman level. Oh, plumber or carpenter and so I would call them either students or interns just because if we use the same language they're used to right and then I think it helps smooth the way interesting yeah word language word medicine it's it's such a, right. a special a special thing in fact I want to give um a shout out to a podcast that's since been discontinued but I really love it for this exact study it's a, a birth doula and I think midwifery student and a linguist. And she created a, a podcast called Birth Words as a way to understand the connotation, the cultural connotation of the words that we use. And there's, I don't know, 70 some episodes. She's not producing anymore, but they're, they're worth listening to. They're short and sweet and interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We'll put it in the show notes because I, I find it really fascinating. Well, so Annie, are you still attending births? Are you retired? Where are you in the world? What are you doing? I'm not sure that I will uh, be able to ever retire. If I do, it'll be it'll be kind of edging out. Right now, I'm not doing a tremendous about one a month. Although it doesn't seem to be one a month. It's two and then zero and two and zero. Um, I did spend a month uh, in Saipan, assisting a, a family there. And that was amazing. And I just happened to have one of those, one of those uh, off times where I actually had three months because of a 38 week birth that I was able to do that. And uh, so this year seems to be a little bit more clustered and then I have bigger chunks of time. So while I used to do four to six a month, I'm now doing an average of one a month. In your and I love that in New Mexico. Yeah, and I, I love being here, and I love uh, the families that I'm working with. There's a lot of repeat clients, and that's always delightful mm -hmm. for them and for me. So, uh huh. Yeah, definitely. And then some travel middle three, which I love. We chatted about that a little while ago. Yeah, that, that going to Saipan and helping that family. She's from Hawaii, and his uh -huh. parents live in Hawaii now. And they've invited me to come for a week and just hang out with them in Hawaii this month. Awesome. So that's sweet. <laughs> that's so sweet. Yeah, I've got yeah. some amazing family friends now because of helping babies all over. Right. Like, it's a beautiful yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to bring midwifery to an area where there is none or there's um, a definition of midwifery that doesn't match the midwifery model of care. It can be a beautiful right. 
beautiful right. experience. This family was frustrated because as they did the birth certificate and put birth at home, checkbox, um, intended, and the hospital is where the vital statistics are collected on, on Saipan, and they ended up plugging in hospital. The mom wasn't happy at all because she, I mean, she wanted credit for what she did, but when they got the official one, it had been changed to uh, birth at home intended which was really nice. They were excited. Yeah. yeah. Good. Amazing. Well, Amy, we'd love to get you to come speak at the Midwifery Wisdom Conference um, coming up sometime soon, either this year or next year. Uh, love to help share your wisdom with the world. I did have a question, though. Did you, in all of your research to develop this product, did you become an NRP instructor? I didn't just research it. You just researched it. no. No, I'm close friends with Karen Strange, and she's mm -hmm. my go-to person. But a lot of it had to do with with uh, measuring and uh, determining angles of what the best best position would be for for the baby to do the open airway and the head tilt back. All of that. I have a. I also have a degree in drafting. Okay. So that part of my brain is the part that I use to create the cradle. That's very cool. That is funny, cool. but yeah. I, I, like I went it. through a lot of iterations, and I knew the material I wanted it to be made out of, but I didn't know what to call it. So it, as I was researching the patent, I ran across something that was very dissimilar, but it was the material I wanted. And so then from there, I was able to find manufacturers here in the U.S. Uh, for both the cradle and the cases that they can go in. Uh, because that was important to me. I wanted to support our economy. Amazing. Amazing. Do you know how many you sold to date? Well, uh, I think we're I think we're just over a thousand. So I mean if we're talking about home birth midwives and birth centers alone, I think we're we're gonna be supplying cradles for the time oh. being. But I would love to get it into other hands. Yeah, there's about 4,000 CPMs. Right. And there's about a thousand birth centers. Right. So yeah, you're, you've not reached market saturation yet. Keep no, going. not at all. <laughs> and then there's the hospital through 15,000 CNMs. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. list goes and here in New Mexico, you don't have to be a CPM. They have their own licensing process right. as well. So yep. there are other states that are like that as well. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think, uh, and then there's new midwives graduating every single day. I love that. that. I love yeah. that. And that was one of my big, um, my big reasons for doing, for having students. And I would have larger classes because I feel like half of my model is helping birthing moms. The other is birthing midwives. And that, that's really important to me. That's beautiful. Yeah. You, your type of, of work is called social entrepreneurialism, right? Is that you're you're making you're making a product and a business off of what is for the the public good, you know? That's true. That's true. I love that. That that's really inspiring. Are there any other inventions up your sleeve? Are you thinking of any other products? Oh, I really haven't. Um some some midwives have approached me for other items and I that they wanted to do. I haven't seen seen them on the market yet, so I'm not sure if they're really going to do that. Probably in the next year or two, I might take that on just to just to get it out on the market. You know, for basically for suturing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that for you, and I love that for us. You're you're serving uh, such an important role, um, being that inspiration of not only. Uh, a really inspiring long-term midwife, but also an entrepreneur who has this side hustle, who's like serving the public good. And that's like, really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love getting the word out there. It's, uh, I think it's an important thing to, to have people understand and know why it's used and how it's used. Um, I always recommend that when you first get your recessor cradle, you actually do some newborn exams in it. The babies seem to love it. I think the snugness in their head 
kind of reminds them of the pelvis and they seem to really have a good time in it. So that's a good way to learn. There's just a little bit of a, of a movement that you do with the head to kind of tuck it into the head cup. And that's a perfect way to learn that uh, with a good, healthy baby instead of last minute when you need it. That's a brilliant idea. Any other suggestions for new adopters? Uh, yes. Keep it with you wherever you go. If the mom's in bed, have it next to the bed. If she goes to the bathroom, please take it with you because you never know. And I use my cradle um, to put the things that I will need for the birth. I have a packet of my instruments. I have gloves. I have, you know, the, the mask. I have a delay. I put all those things in it. So if you end up in the bathroom and the baby's not doing well, you can dump those things and put the baby in the cradle, but you'll have everything you need right there by you. Brilliant. Brilliant. And it comes in a case too. You can buy a case that it goes with. We have two size cases, <clears throat> the original size case, and then uh, my daughter, who's a midwife, asked that I make one that would hold an O2 tank. And so we added uh, some inches to the original cradle, and now we have two versions, the original and then the larger case that can hold a B, C, or D uh, tank without regulators because we shouldn't be transferring oxygen mm -hmm. with a regulator on. Um, exactly. But I see it, so I plug that. Um, and, and people can choose what they want if they order the small and realize they want the large or they order the original cradle and decide they need the, the, the transport cradle. We're really good about flexing with that and, and making sure they have the equipment that they need and want. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, Annie, thank you so much. And uh, here's to the future of, of safe her resuscitation, the more comfortable, more efficient resuscitations for for our babies, our families, and ourselves. It's a great pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for inviting me. We will chat later. Yeah, definitely.